Let's do it in. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Welcome to day three of our first ever fully virtual reflect reflections projections. Before we begin, I'd like to walk the attendees over a few of the technical details of the Zoom webinar system. Feel free to use the chat during the talk, but please make sure your behavior is appropriate. To ask questions, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. You may ask anonymously as well if you would like. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Vaishu to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Omar. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, Reflections Projections is extremely excited to have Salima Mershi. Um, Salima is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research AI and currently chairs Microsoft's Ether Working Group on uh, Human AI Interaction and Collaboration. Today, she'll be talking about her work in furthering responsible AI by planning to fail and the process behind developing Microsoft's guidelines for human AI interaction. Um, with that, I'll give the floor to Salima. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Vishu. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you all. Um, I'll be talking about why creating responsible AI uh, requires planning for failure. Um, and this talk is going to cover some work that we're doing at MSR and also as part of Microsoft's Ether initiative. And so Ether is Microsoft's Advisory Council on AI and Ethics. So uh, we created the Ether initiative at Microsoft because um, as we all know, AI is being used in more and more of our everyday applications and services, uh, and is also fundamentally changing how we interact with those systems. This is in turn creating new challenges for people. And we see this in everything from humorous speech recognition failures to really dangerous situations where people have actually been harmed. So for example, when they can't effectively take over control when their AI system fails, like in this example that you're seeing on screen where uh, an AI operating the semi-autonomous vehicle failed to detect a fire truck stopped on the road and the user was not able to take back control. So many of these challenges are caused by various kinds of AI failures. So in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk about different types of AI failures uh, and how many of these failures are inherent and in some cases unavoidable with AI. Then I'll also talk about how many of these failure, failures are socio-technical in nature, not just technical, meaning that they involve consideration of how AI algorithms and models will be interacting with people and society in the real world. And then finally, I'll talk about what we can do to more proactively anticipate and plan for these types of failures to create more responsible AI systems. Okay, so why all this talk about failures? So we recently started asking people who build AI systems what their perceptions are about AI biases and fairness issues and ethical issues like the kind that you see in the news. And we heard some interesting and in some cases really alarming responses. So for example, we asked some AI creators about issues like Amazon's uh, recruiting tool, which showed a bias against women. And a common sentiment that we heard is what we call the this is reality argument, which goes something like this. There are a lot of people who do not see this as a problem. The attitude is that is ex actually what reality looks like. Now, this is a dangerous sentiment because even if there is a gender imbalance in the engineering field, it's actually incorrect to say that AI models represent reality. So AI models by definition are a simplification of the world meaning it's difficult, if not impossible, to ever fully capture all the complexities of the real world. So let's look at closely at this uh, AI-based hiring scenario, scenario. So in this scenario, imagine you know, your goal is to build a classifier to distinguish between people you might want to hire and people you don't want to hire. Now, how you represent those people to the AI algorithm is really important. So in this case, maybe you only have access to two types of information, like uh, the number of years of higher education that person has had and their previous salary. 
So what this means is you're missing a lot of important information that impacts whether or not someone will actually be a good candidate to hire, like their ability to collaborate or their life experiences. Uh, and that's because a lot of relevant information about real life is actually just very difficult to capture computationally. So what an AI algorithm is gonna do is it's going to do its best to learn a model based on the information you give it. So maybe it'll learn this type of model. But this is just goes to show that this is not reality, right? We can't, if we can't fully capture the world, then this is not capturing um, everything that is important for making these types of decisions. And so it's important to challenge this argument, especially when AIs are being used in real life situations where people might be adversely affected. Now, another argument that we heard a lot is what we call the this is just math argument, and which goes something like this. At the end of the day, the data is just aggregated and shown. It's not gonna be wrong what they're going to see. It's still going to be right. We're not expressing opinions or anything. Now, the idea that because this is math, it must be right is again, not true. Uh, and is also dangerous because it can lend a false sense of credibility to potentially harmful results. Okay, so going back to our hiring model example, uh, AI algorithms are designed to learn models that generalize to new data while optimizing some objective function, like minimizing loss on errors uh, or errors on the training set. And so in doing so, they're necessarily gonna trade off errors and sacrifice parts of the input space to produce the best possible function. Okay, so in this case, the algorithm might first try this model which has eight errors. Then it might try a different model, so this model, which has seven errors. And then it might ultimately choose this one. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that even if algorithms are just math, the math itself here is designed to do the best under the circumstances. And in these circumstances, because algorithms can't fully capture the real world, they need to sound, allow for some errors. Okay, so AIs are going to make these types of mistakes. And so responsible AI development needs to involve acknowledging these types of errors and working to proactively mitigate potential harms that could be caused by these errors. Um, another example of what we heard a lot when talking to people about AI failures is what we call the there is no problem here argument, which goes something like this. The other thing to note is that there's a lot of talk about machine learning models being biased, right? Is that how you say it? So there's actually no bias in our models just because it's very analytical. Okay, so again here, you know, it might be true that the model or the algorithm is not itself encoding any bias. Although, you know, as we've seen, the algorithms themselves can and will make errors by design. This is still just a reductive view of AI systems that, um, fails to sort of think of AI systems more holistically. So AI systems are made up not only of models, but it also made up of data that goes into those models, uh, the infrastructure over which those models and data run, uh, and the interfaces that users will be seeing and interacting with. So even if there's no problem with the model or data, which, you know, again, there likely is, failures can still occur at any of these other sites and result in harms to people. So for example, studies have shown that in high stakes decision making, just the length of an explanation in an interface can influence people. So meaning regardless of whether the prediction is correct, people have been misled by AI systems just because of the way uh, their pre its predictions are presented to them. Okay, so again, it's important to think about AI systems holistically and think about all the places where they might fail. Now, uh, I want to emphasize that, you know, failing to recognize failures doesn't reflect any ill intentions of people, like the people we talk to or people who think this way. Um, it, in most cases, it just reflects a perspective that AI is a purely technical endeavor. And that's partially about because of how AI and machine learning has been traditionally taught in schools. So for example, people are often, uh, or students are often given, you know, benchmark data sets to work with, um, generic metrics to op optimize. Um, and so there's a lot of focus on the model or the algorithm, but that can also hide a lot of um, what goes into making a real working system, like 
choosing the right data sets or picking the right metrics or creating the right interfaces. Okay, so, you know, for those students out there who are interested in this space, I'd, you know, really encourage uh, you to spend some time trying to build like working AI applications to see sort of what goes into actually collecting good quality data and the difficulty of doing so and the difficulty of choosing the right algorithms and parameters. And I'd also recommend, you know, taking courses um, in social sciences or human computer interaction along with AI and machine learning so you can learn about how you can help the people who are ultimately going to be using these AI applications um, and help them uh, better interact with them. Okay, so it's important to think about AI systems and how they might fail um, because they inevitably will. And it's important to plan for such failures to help people recover when those failures occur. Now, I also wanna emphasize that by planning for failures here, I don't mean that we shouldn't do our due diligence to try to avoid or reduce biases and errors in our algorithms and models. I'm just saying that even if we do this work, there are still going to be failures because of some of the issues that I've talked about. Um, and so responsibly, I was still going to require building safeguards for people to mitigate those failures when they inevitably occur. Okay, so how can we start thinking about failures or uh, anticipating them or, or planning for them? So we recently created these guidelines for human AI interaction, which prescribe how AI systems should behave as a user interacts with them. Uh, and we've been using them at Microsoft to frame different types of socio-technical failures and to help people think through and mitigate some of the issues that I've talked about. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about how we uh, created the guidelines, um, but for that, you can read our, our corresponding paper shown here. Uh, but I wanted to give you a quick sense of the process that we took to create the guidelines. So in creating these, we went through four rounds of iteration and evaluation with over 60 user experience practitioners across the company. Um, and the guidelines themselves are also being used by teams across the com company to help them improve their AI user experiences. So this is just to say that, you know, we didn't just make these up and we really endeavored to take a systematic and rigorous approach to de developing and vetting these guidelines so we could ourselves feel comfortable and confident in their effectiveness. Um, so again, you can uh, read the paper for more information. Um, but I wanted to give, give you a few examples of um, how to use these guidelines and what these guidelines are actually saying. So these are the guidelines again, there are 18 of them. And they can be roughly grouped um, into four categories based on when they would apply as a user interacts with them. Uh, initially, during regular interaction with the user, when the AI is inevitably wrong, and how the system should behave over time. Now, these are rough categories. Uh, they're not hard assignments. And we, we did it this way to make them easier to remember. Now, we didn't originally develop these guidelines with failures in mind, but we've uh, recently been using them to help teams think through different types of socio-technical AI failures uh, and to help them think of mitigate, mitigation strategies to avoid them. So, you know, if I had to rename these categories, I'd um, say these groupings tend to map to how to mitigate or avoid um, expectation mismatches contextual mismatches, uh, AI model errors, and evolution issues. Okay, so I'm gonna give you again a, a few examples for each of these, um, and so you can get a sense of how they can help you plan for uh, failures. And I'll give you examples within the context of common AI-based products that many of you, us probably use um, sometimes even every day including search engines, which use AI for things like uh, processing queries, ranking results, filtering spam, voice-based virtual assistants, uh, which, uses, uh, which use AI for speech processing and task and productivity support, um, email, which uses AI for spam filtering or sorting emails or language processing to automate tasks, and uh, social networks, uh, which use AI often for filtering or sorting your news feeds. Okay, so these examples 
um, I'm going to give our, our um, based on our actual studies of the guidelines um, and then based on actual products uh, across the industry. Okay. So the first category here is all about setting the right expectations. And expectations are really important because people often have unrealistic expectations about AI because of how they're portrayed in the media and because of the lack of knowledge about how these people have about how these things work. So let's look at these within the context of search engines. Okay, so even though search engines have been around for quite a long time, most people don't really understand how they work or how accurate they are. And in fact, studies of people searching the web have shown that many people think just everything is on the web, meaning all knowledge is available on the web, which you know is of course not true. And this misconception can impact how much people will trust the results that a search engine returns. Similarly, studies have shown that if you ask people how search engines work, you know, a third of people will use terms like magic um, to explain it, while others will give some idea of what they think, how they think a search engine is, is ranking the results, um, which is not, doesn't often reflect how they actually are. So again, this is going to impact how people, how much people trust the quality or relevance of the results that they get. Now, you know, you might be thinking, well, it's just search, it's not really high stakes, so, you know, it's fine if people overestimate its capabilities. But, you know, if you think about all the ways and, um, and how much people rely on search these days, you know, you can think of a lot of uh, problematic scenarios. So take, for example, uh, a person searching the web for who won the popular vote in 2016. You know, a search engine that res returns results uh, like this, um, sometimes including untrusty news sources, can easily mislead people if they expect uh, the search engine to return high quality results. Okay, so what can you actually do about this? So one possibility is to provide people with some documentation. Uh, and by documentation here, I don't necessarily mean, you know, providing people with a manual. And in fact, um, this example I'm showing is uh, actually from a real example um, from someone searching for who won the popular vote. Um, and it was particularly problematic because um, the heading that was being used said in the news. And that went further in setting people's expectations about the results that they were getting. Okay, so since um, this incident happened, Google has since changed the heading to say um, top stories, I believe, to help fight fake news. So this just goes to show that, you know, just the language you use really makes a difference. But you know, documentation is not the only way to set expectations. And, you know, in, in fact, unless you're working in a scenario where people are incentivized to put in the time to read documentation, um, I'd recommend using this approach somewhat sparingly. Um, but there are a lot of other ways that we can set expectations. And, and in our studies, we found many common patterns that people have come up with. So for example, uh, a way of set, setting expectations Include showing people examples of the types of things they can search for. Um, you can also provide people with uh, controls, which they which can uh, indirectly give them a sense of what the system can do or how it can work. So in this case, for search, you can um, select uh, from different sources of information, and that again helps to set expectations. So the point here is that this is the time for us to get creative. Um, and uh, our, the paper in our paper and on our web page, which I'll share at the end, um, we have a lot more uh, of examples and patterns that people have used to implement um, each of the guidelines that I'm going to talk that I'm talking about today. Okay. Now, uh, some of you may, might be thinking, you know, aren't these guidelines important for all computing systems, not just AI? And to that, I'd say in some cases, yes. So when we developed the guidelines, we included guidelines that were either specific to AI or particularly important or particularly challenging for the AI setting. Um, so in this case, you know, setting the right expectations is, is important for all systems, but it's particularly challenging in AI systems because they can behave unpredictably in new situations. And so 
actually applying these guidelines uh, often requires new solutions um, to implement them within the AI context. Okay, so the next category is all about context. Uh, and context is important for AI because AI systems make inferences about people and their needs. And those needs depend on the user's environment, their current task and attention, as well as the larger social and cultural context in which they're operating. Okay, so let's look at these uh, within the context of a proactive virtual um, or voice-based virtual assistant. So imagine that you had an assistant that could you know, proactively send you reminders when they're due. The first two guidelines here are all about a person's immediate surroundings. And so with a proactive AI system, it's important to think carefully about when and where people will likely be interacting with them. So for example, if my assistant could remind me to call my mom, um, if I tend to be using my assistant um, in context where in critical, while I'm doing critical tasks like driving, untimely reminders like this could actually be quite dangerous. Okay, so what can you do? Um, first, uh, you can conduct user research to identify the types of contexts um, your user base will be using the application in. And then uh, infer those contexts and time service AI services or show relevant AI information based on those inferred contexts. Okay, and this is, these are something that you can't do in the UI alone. Um, you know, inferring critical context requires, you know, monitoring appropriate signals um, and building that into your models. Now, the next two guidelines in this category are about the larger social and cultural context that people are operating in. Um, and so again, imagine, you know, you have um, your virtual assistant and you could ask your assistant what the fastest route home is. Um, and this is actually an example we tested in our studies. And interestingly, most people couldn't recognize any potential for biases in this type of application. Um, in most cases, you know, people said things like, information is not subject to biases unless users are biased against fastest, fastest routes. Except one person in our study said, there's no way to set an average walking speed. The product assumes users to be healthy. And so this was really eye-opening for me in that, you know, even for seemingly benign applications like, you know, a map application, people could actually be harmed or experience biases. And so to help mitigate these biases, it's important to, you know, invest in tools and algorithms to reduce um, biases. But it's also important, um, as this example highlights, to involve people with diverse backgrounds and experiences uh, during development and testing to help uh, identify and prevent those biases from being introduced in the first place. Okay, so the third category is all about what to do when the AI model itself is wrong. And again, I can't stress this enough, the AI is going to be wrong. And so it's important to include mechanisms to reduce the cost to users when this happens. Okay, so let's look at this within the context of email. So many email clients now have the ability to um, sort important from unimportant emails. Um, so the first two guidelines here are really all about um, detecting common uh, uh, model errors, like false positives and false negative errors. Okay, so in this scenario of an email client, a false positive might be uh, flagging something like spam as important, which you know, might not be a big deal, uh, but a false negative might mean flagging something important, like you know, an email from your boss, as not important, which could actually be quite costly if you, if you miss it. So what uh, the guidelines in this category suggest um, is to um, understand how common AI errors manifest in a particular application and estimate the costs of those errors on people. And different types of errors will have different costs to people. And then uh, the next thing you want to do is a pro provide appropriate mitigations for particularly costly errors. So in this case, you might want to um, allow people to move um, uh, emails between these 
uh, not important in important buckets or show people snippets of what's being categorized in the not important bucket um, to prevent missing um, uh, important emails. Um, now, again, the rest of the guidelines in this category are all about what to do and how to deal with common uh, AI errors. Okay, uh, the final category here is about what to do as a user interacts with an AI system over time. And this is important because um, in AI because, you know, one of the key benefits of AI models are their ability to learn and improve over time. But this can also be quite disruptive if it's not designed carefully. So uh, let's look at this in, within the context of social networks that can uh, automatically filter or promote content in your newsfeed. So um, I recently made the mistake of looking at a post from a friend um, that looked like this, which then almost immediately, you know, released this onslaught of sunshine and cheer in my social media feed. And it was really frustrating because, you know, I couldn't figure out how to make it stop. I, I didn't know why what it was happening and all my attempts to redirect my feed to things I was actually interested in failed. Okay, so let's look at what's going on here. So here, you know, my social network is clearly learning something from my behavior, you know, which, which could be a good thing if it's done correctly. So maybe I, you know, dwelled on this post for too long or interacted with it. Um, but the problem is, in this case, it got it wrong, right? And it almost immediately and, you know, seemingly completely transformed my feed, which is not what I wanted. So guideline 14 here recommends updating and adapting cautiously, which is all about carefully uh, tuning the rate and the amount of changes that you introduce by AI model updates to ensure a good user experience. Um, similarly, guideline 15 here is about enabling people to provide explicit feedback to help um, steer their AI systems to do what they want. Um, so in this case, you know, I had the ability to like posts, but I didn't have the ability to dislike something, which may have helped because maybe I could uh, steer it away from content I was I'm not interested in. Okay, so these and the other guidelines in this category are all about how to ensure AIs that change over time can do so in a way to preserve the user experience and avoid harms. Um, now, my, this, this example you know, makes light of these evolutionary issues, um, but I wanted to give you a similar example that highlights uh, how you know, seemingly minor incidents like these can actually harm people. So this is a true story by a reporter named uh, Jillian Brockle, who lost her baby late last year. Uh, and soon after that, she wrote an open letter to Facebook and Twitter to stop showing her baby related ads. And she goes on to talk about how she tried to make the ad stop, but was unable to do so. And uh, Facebook and Twitter have since apologized for the incident. Um, but this, you know, again, highlights the more general problem of um, socio-technical AI failures resulting in harms to people. So again, you know, the guidelines can help, you know, proactively anticipate and plan for some of these types of failures. So, um, you know, again, for my example um, here, you know, uh, the social network, her Jillian's social networking feed clearly learned from her behavior that she was pregnant, but never learned that she had lost her baby. Um, and so started showing contextually incorrect ads. Now, uh, Jillian talks about being able to dismiss the ads that she was seeing by hiding individual ads, but that, that wasn't really the problem. That wasn't really enough, right? She didn't have a problem with any particular ad. She had a problem with these types of ads. So um, providing a global control um, to turn off parental ads is something that actually some of these social networks have uh, but Jillian again goes on to talk about not being able to find them. And so again, allowing people to provide uh, explicit feedback about what they want to see could have helped uh, in this scenario. Okay, so to summarize, um, you know, uh, failures are inherent in AI and are social technical in nature. Um, and so uh, systematically and proactively mitigating uh, AI failures can help and can reveal new opportunities for ensuring safe, fair, and responsible uh, AI in our society. 
Uh, and one way you can try to work towards proactively mitigating failures is by thinking through um, uh, sort of common uh, issues and common types of AI failures using the guidelines that I presented here. So with that, um, thanks again for having me. And at this point, I can take questions. Right. Um, thank you so much, Salima, for the wonderful talk. It was super interesting. Um, before we go into the QA portion, we have a quick announcement. Thank you so much, Salima, for your wonderful talk. Um, before we go into the Q&A portion, I'd like to invo invite all attendees to visit events.reflectionsprojections.org slash attendance and enter the code and the link I will put in the chat. We will be using responses to this form to pick winners for our Grubhub gift card giveaway. So don't share this code with your friends. And yeah, hope you win. All right. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A that I'll um, start reading. Um, the first question is, uh, what are the best practices for maintaining these systems as new data is added to that can create bias? Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, and th a lot of the guidelines in this sort of green category here are about sort of um, these evolving systems that can evolve based on new data coming in or data shifts or um, changes in people's behavior. And so I think there's um, a lot we can do, including um, building in the capability to quickly um, update models. I think that's often something that's overlooked when um, releasing um, products is that, you know, you may put in a lot of time to build an AI model or a product, but, you know, um, knowing that people can adapt and the AI can adapt and you might need to, you know, revert a model or update quickly to address uh, an error that surfaces um, is something that we can, you know, try to architect our systems to do uh, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question. How do you think uh, we can bring diversity into AI research? Yeah, um, uh, any way possible. <laughs> You know, I think this is incredibly critical. Um, there is a lot of, so the, there's, there's a lot of work going on in the AI communities um, around, you know, um, uh, safe and fair AI algorithms, but there's also a lot of work now going on in some of the other related fields. So like human computer interaction is the field that I, I work in a lot. Um, and so I think there is a lot of interest across disciplines in this. Um, but something that we need to start doing more of is bringing these disciplines together. Um, because, you know, something that we talk about, if you go on our on the website here, we have a bunch of articles about how actually achieving any of these guidelines really requires a back and forth between um, thinking about the user experience and thinking about the algorithms. And it's not something that you can really do well in silos. So, um, that, you know, having more people, you know, learn about this or um, being, you know, inclusive of people across different disciplines is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for students that want to go into AI research? You were talking about this like a little bit earlier, talking about like the different courses people should take and like what kind of projects they could do. Yeah. Um, so, so it, there's, there's so much to be done. <laughs> um, you know, I think this is a really exciting um, space. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, like I said earlier, there's a lot of focus still on, you know, AI algorithms um, and how we can improve those. But there's, I think there's so, so many open questions around the sort of end-to-end -end model development process. And studies have shown that, you know, in the practice of AI, um, most of the time is actually not spent on running that algorithm. It's spent on like collecting the data or debugging and iterating um, and you know going through many different types of models. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to figure out um, better ways to do those other tasks that are required to build like working AI systems. And again, you know, you know, I really like working at the intersection of fields. I think that really you know, brings to light, um, you know, interesting questions. And so reaching across 
um, the aisle or taking courses in a variety of, um, you know, taking a variety of classes can help, you know, expose you to new ideas for uses of AI or how you can bring in um, new methods to help in building AI systems. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a comment from Dylan. He says, um, hi, Salima. I'm curious if you worked with anyone from um, academia while developing these guidelines. It seems like there could be a degree of negative corporate influence while developing anything AI related. Yeah, so um, so MSR is, is, is very academic for one. Um, uh, but that is the important consideration. And so we had um, a visiting researcher from the University of Washington who, who um, worked with me, Dan Weld. So he's an AI researcher um, who worked a lot with us on this. Um, but I would also say, if you look at the paper, um, the guidelines are actually based on 20 years worth of research in the academic community and in, in the industrial community. And so we actually, it's almost like a synthesis of what are best practices that have been introduced in academia um, and have, that have been tried and tested in, um, you know, products that people use. So I think it reflects a bit of both of that. Mm -hmm. um, so if a model has previously failed and the developers wish to fine tune that model and re-release it, to what level should we ensure that such a failure and other failures do not happen again? Uh, yeah, so I, like I think there's you could do a ton of research just on this question um, because it's not just uh, um, so it's I'm looking back at the question. So you want to ensure that such a failure doesn't happen again, but you also might introduce new failures um, by changing a model. Like even if your model improves overall, you could actually have you know pockets of data that will um, now your model will not work well on when it worked previously on that data. And we've seen this, you know, when people, people will adapt and learn um, and have um, create expectations about how their system works. And if it changes and they're not notified of those changes, that can actually be very detrimental, right? So um, it's, I think it's more about not necessarily ensuring that failures happen or don't happen again, but making sure that your users are informed of the necessary changes, right? And are know that they might need to adjust their expectations. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we've had, there's been AI models that, you know, help doctors make medical decisions. Um, and in some cases, you know, you have a, um, a, a model that's trained on, you know, the adult population and therefore might not be able to make good recommendations for children. Mm -hmm. And a doctor who has started, who's like had experience with using that AI might have an expectation that they should only trust it for adults and not for children. But now if there's a model update and now your model's suddenly doing well on, you know, kids and making predictions of kids, if the, if the doctor doesn't know, they're, they're going to uh, not be able to use the AI effectively. So there's, you know, um, part of it is about, you know, n how you, help people to understand how these changes are made. And that's not just like how you communicate to the people, but how you even detect um, what those meaningful changes are so that you can tell people. Mm -hmm. um, kind of as a follow-up to what you said, do you think it's ever possible to like completely address them or uh, since you introduce like new ones all the time to like what extent do you think it's possible to like prevent um, these failures? Would it like be possible to quantify it? To quantify, um, that's an interesting question. I, um, it's very difficult because, you know, the the goal of AI algorithms are to like generalize to new scenarios, right? So it's um, it's it's an interesting question, and I haven't thought about that, so I, I don't really know what the answer is, but um, it's something to think about. Um, the next question is, what new issues do you think following machine learning, um, like following the um, ML guidelines you mentioned will have like privacy, privacy issues or like what kind of issues do you see like on the horizon? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, the, so one thing that we like to say when we're talking about the guidelines is that they shouldn't be considered 
a checklist and not all of them are going to apply in every situation. And so you do in the end, um, when you're building AI systems have to think about uh, the trade-offs between, you know, achieving these guidelines and achieving other um, goals, right? So in some cases, you know, privacy, it's trying to achieve privacy might be at odds with, you know, um, inferring people's context, right? But maybe you need to infer people's surroundings so that you can provide more accurate predictions, right? So it's, it's, it can be difficult to achieve both. So, you know, I think what we're trying to advocate for is to think about these um, issues intentionally and like make intentional decisions about what you're trying to optimize for. And that might be different in, in different situations. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I'm just going to combine a couple of questions about you. Um, so it's why did you chose to go into research and like what do you enjoy about about it? Um, oh gosh, I, I love research. It's just you can explore new ideas and you're always learning. Um, I, I think I just like to learn and solve problems and research kind of gives you a lot of flexibility to pursue, um, you know, interesting questions. Mm -hmm. um, so we I, I, I could also say that, you know, I did a lot of um, like research kind of internships, even as an undergrad, and that like gave me some experience in it. And, and you know, that's when I first started realizing how much I just enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a comment about like uh, the inter intersection between AI and HCI. So uh, someone said, I like the research field between AI and HCI. However, it seems kind of hard for um, academics to pursue research related to human and AI. To me, it is easier for industry since it's easy um, access to data and users, even just collecting unbiased data. So what's your suggestion for people doing research in this field? Yeah, so that is a good question. Um, there's definitely ways to um, collaborate with industrial researchers. So, you know, a lot of industry um, uh, cor corporations have like internships for, you know, students to come. Like, you know, like I mentioned, I did several of those as, as a student myself, and that was a good way for me to get exposed to new problems, but also to ac get access to, you know, real life data um, and users. Um, so that's one way. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a really important question because I think this is part of the tension, right? Like, you know, as a student, you know, you you have only access to like, you know, publicly available data sets and they might be small. And so, you know, what else can you do, you know, other than like use those data? Like um, there, you know, there are ways to collect your own data, but can you do it at enough scale um, so that you can, you know, build robust systems? Um, that That's a hard problem. And it's something that I think, you know, by not gaining that experience in collecting data, you know, you miss out on a lot, a lot of these important problems that, that you, that are introducing biases and problems in, in the systems, right? Um, so, you know, um, it, I, I think it, it, it's a good question. Um, if you're a student, I would recommend internships as one way to help. Yeah, um, so Dylan has another question. Do you have any insight as to the trade-offs or the considerations when choosing to do research for a corporation versus an academia? Um, can you, can you repeat that? Sure. Um, do you have any insight as to the trade-offs or considerations when choosing to do research for a corporation versus an academia? Um, it depends. So, uh, it, it depends on what field you're in. You know, I think like the previous question, you know, in the AI field, you know, there is some advantages to being in a corporation because you have access to data, but that's, um, I think there are a lot of, um, not only you, you can, I think, partner with corporations in a lot of ways, um, even not during an internship, but to collaborate on data so that you might look into that. Um, there are other trade-offs, right? Like um, there's uh, in, at least at MSR, you know, the, um, the, the model is different, right? You don't have to 
um, apply for funding, which you spend a lot of time doing if you go, you know, become, go into academia. Mm -hmm. um, but in some corporations that might mean you have less freedom in what you work on because, you know, it might be tied to the corporation. In some cases, like, you know, MSR, like it's quite open and you can sort of work wherever you want. So uh, work on whatever you want, right? Um, so there's sort of just different trade-offs on like what you like to do. I think another big um, difference typically between, between industrial research and academia is the teaching aspects, right? So, um, you know, if you really enjoy teaching and mentoring students, um, you can do that often in, in industrial research, you know, through internships, but it's usually on a shorter sort of duration. Um, whereas, you know, in academia, you can build like lasting, you know, relationships and like really, you know, influence people over a long period of time. Right. Um, how can we jumpstart our careers or, and jobs in related to AI ethics? Um, like as a student, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, I, so, okay, let's see. Um, one thing I liked to do, I remember as a student myself was to, um, do a lot of like projects in the areas that I was interested in. So, you know, for assignments that you have in class, you know, in AI, you know, think about applications that are in the ethical space. That's like one way to sort of get experience doing that. Um, I again would also recommend um, internships as a way of, of doing that because um, you not only you can get exposed to um, a lot of uh, you know new research environments and work in collaborating with uh, new researchers. So that's always um, a, a bonus as well. Um, and also, you know, there's a lot of AI related conferences now. I'm um, sorry, AI and ethics related conferences. So you know, there's um, Fact now, I think it's called. It used to be Fat Star. There's AIES, and so you know, starting to get familiar with sort of what is the state of the art right now, and what are some of the open challenges. Um, I think is a good way to start. Mm -hmm. um, does MSR offer research internships to undergrads? Um, yes, there is. I think an undergrad research intern program, uh, it's, m it's typically mostly grad students, but I do believe like if you go on the MSR website that um, they, there are, there are some programs um, geared to undergrads. Mm -hmm. um, another question we have is, is it safe to assume that the lessening of failures correlates with an increase in the number of data parameters? If so, would we approach some sort of a data limit in, a, in an attempt to minimize failures? That's it correlates with an increasing number of data parameters. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily true, right? Um, um, I think that it's like, I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily correlated, right? So it, part of it, part of dealing with failures um, involves what, how you represent the data and what data you collect. Um, and, you know, you can introduce more parameters, but that's not the only way to address these types of failures. Uh, so, you know, some of the examples I gave were really about um, what you show people in the interface that, you know, doesn't have any impact necessarily on, on the algorithm or the, the parameters mm -hmm. of a model. Um, also, you know, in some cases, if you want to give people an explanation, um, often, you know, a, a model with fewer parameters is, is easier to explain. And there's a lot of work in, you know, transparency um, and explainability of AI systems. So in that case, you actually want to, you know, possibly reduce the number of parameters. Um, so so I, I think you don't need to assume that. And there's a lot of ways you can, um, you know, help remove or reduce failures without increasing the data parameters. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna be our last question of today. Um, it seems that a lot of topics are related to personalization to some extent, and how do we balance the trade-off between like model generation and personalization concerns? Um, I guess so, models and personalization concerns. So I guess I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the issue 
Um, so personalization, I guess, I guess the question is like how uh, the, the trade-off between generalization and personalization. Um, I think it, it, it needs to be scenario dependent. So in some cases, personalization is really important, um, you know, in order to get, enable people to, you know, have a, a good user experience for the system to learn from errors. Um, but that can come at a cost to like, we talked about earlier, like privacy, right? Um, uh, and so there's, there's different trade-offs that need to be made. And I think it's very context dependent. Um, thank you so much for answering all of our questions. This was like very insightful and very exciting. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks and thanks for having me. Feel free to reach out with quest further questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. And just a couple quick announcements. Um, after this talk, we will be having another talk about the startup scene with Sim, the startup we mentioned, and we had speakers from last um, on Monday. And we also have our keynote tonight with CTO of PayPal, SVP, Sri Shavananda. So please, please do come out to that, those talks as well. We also have a Discord challenge going on where we are giving away another $20 Growth Hub gift card. And if you are not already on the Discord, I will drop the invite link below. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.